Hello, welcome back to my channel. This is an axial deformation problem. Um, this tutorial, TT06B, is very closely related to one I just recorded, which is TT06A. So I strongly recommend you go and watch TT06A first, because this one is going to be a little more accelerated, um, a little more targeted to how this problem is different from TTO6A, which is an easier problem. This one's a little trickier. All right, let's read the problem statement. As always, we have a compound axial member. Compound basically means we're sticking various things together, as shown. Axial means that all of these loads are applied down the longitudinal axis of the member. Um, this structure is fixed at H, so we have the rightmost plane fixed. That's going to be a notable difference between this problem and the other tutorial I mentioned. The material is A36 steel, so you're going to want to look up. You have steel. If you haven't already memorized that one, it's a good one to commit to memory, it's 200 gigapascals for all grade, vir virtually all grades of steel, and definitely for A36 steel, which is a mild grade of steel. Um, very ductile, low strength, low carbon. Okay, and um, we'd like to figure out what is the translation of the plane containing E. So where does this plane move in the deformed geometry is what we have been asked to find. All right. I think the first thing we're going to want to do, so this picture that we're given up at the top, of course, this is our loading diagram, and we're going to want to turn this into a free body diagram. This is going to be a pretty easy change. We're going to want to free the body from that support. So down here, note that the support hasn't been shown, it isn't, has, has been removed from that drawing, but we do want to include a force reaction at this plane. Let's spot check static equilibrium. I'll do this um, the fast way. I'll do this the fast way. So here is how I would do this if I was not trying to like show all my work on an exam. I've got 50 kilonewtons to the left. I'll pop. Oh, I've got XY on there already. Okay, awesome. So that would be in the negative X direction. I have got 70 kilonewtons to the right. That means I have a net effect of 20 to the right. To put that in equilibrium, I need 20 kilonewtons to the left. Now I am in static equilibrium, and now I am good to go. If you wanted to do this the mathematically pure way, you could do a summation of forces in the x direction, but reach the same conclusion. All right, now that I've got my free body and that unknown reaction solved for, I'm ready to go into my normal force diagram. The best way to do this, the way that I recommend that you do this, is with a series of free bodies. I'm going to merge this with this, turn that down, new layer, great. Okay, so here's what I recommend. Cut here to expose the internal force on that segment. I've got 50 kilonewtons here. That means 50 kilonewtons of tension so that that free body is in equilibrium. Tension, of course, is positive. So I'll draw that right here as 50 kilonewtons of tension. Okay, next segment. We need to expose the internal normal force between F and G. I could use either side of the free body. I'll just happen to pick the right side. So we draw our body, draw the forces applied. So I've got the 40, I have the 20. And by inspection, in order to put this in equilibrium, I need 20 more pointing to the left in order for the sum of forces on this free body to be zero and keep it in static equilibrium. 20 kilonewtons arrows pointing away from the body, that is a tension force. So let us plot that on the tension side of things. Out here. Uh, 
lastly, we need to go into our final piece of the free body. And I'm going to do this one a little differently just to show you that you can. I'm going to cut here. I'm going to cut here. I'm going to choose to use this free body just so that you understand just how creative you can get with these cuts. Okay, what do we need to put this free body in equilibrium? Well, I've got 40 kilonewtons here. My unknown cut there, I can get off my diagram. It's a pulling force or a tensile force of 20. So 20 kilonewtons goes to the left, arrow pointing away from the body. Now I can solve for my unknown normal force at this plane. In order to put this structure in equilibrium, I need a force of 20 kilonewtons pointing to the left. Note that this reaction doesn't show up in that free body, right? Because we cut it off, we cut it out. All right, so I have 20 kilonewtons of compression in this final free body. We'll update my internal normal force diagram accordingly. And as I mentioned in the other video, even though the normal force is undefined at these jumps, it is still conventional to draw these lines. Engineers have just developed ways of communicating over the years and we just do what they tell us to do. I do not know why that tool is not working. Ah, too much pink. Okay, sorry about that. All right, we are moving right along. All right, so doing this step, diagramming the internal normal force is an important concept for this unit. We did our global equilibrium and determined our reaction there first. After that, we did our internal normal force, internal axial force um, diagram. We're asked to find translation of a plane containing E. And since E is very far away from the only thing we know, the only thing we know, which is that H doesn't move, I can write an expression that says the translation I can say that the translation of plane E is equal to the cumulative effects. I got to be really careful about how I write this because I don't want to lead you astray. Let me think for just a second. The cumulative effects of the sum of the deformation in member EF, FG, G, H. The positive versus minus sign here, what I mean to say this, and I really don't want to mathematically lead you away, is that this will be done by inspection, okay? And here's what I mean by that. If the summation of these deformations, two of which will be elongation, one of which is going to be shortening. If their summation is net elongation, then plane E will tend to move to the left, meaning if you are using this Cartesian coordinate system, you would pick a negative sign if this sum were to be positive. Okay, we'll come back to this concept later in the video. Um, I just want to make sure I'm not leading you astray with the notation. We need to figure out the cumulative change in length between E and H. If the cumulative change of change in length is shortening, that means E moves in the positive x direction because it's anchored at H, okay? And the converse is true as well. Okay, let's do, um, let's go ahead and do this summation of the deformations. So I'm gonna do the deformation between E and H is equal to first term delta EF. 
We're going to use for each one of these my equation. I'll do it in purple over here. Axial deformation is equal to NL over AE. It's my axial deformation equation. All right. For segment EF, our N normal force, that is positive 50 kilonewtons. My length is given as 5 meters, but I'm thinking ahead. I'm going to go ahead and put that in millimeters because I know that a gigapascal a gigapascal is defined as a kilonewton per millimeters squared. So if I preload all kilonewtons and millimeters, those units will cancel out my gigapascal. So I'm just thinking ahead about my units as I go. In the denominator, I need the area section a section ee there is the cross section right there it's just a circle so i'm going to use pi over four diameter 75 squared millimeter squared and our modulus of elasticity 200 kilonewtons per millimeter squared see how i'm tossing that up into the numerator okay check units, cancel things out. So now I've got my kilonewtons, I've got my kilonewtons, millimeters squared from the area, millimeter, millimeter squared up there, that leaves total units of millimeters. When you multiply this out, you are going to get 282.9 E minus 3 millimeters. And it is positive because the force is positive. That means that this is an elongation. OK, you would do a similar procedure for member FG and GH. You get all of your internal forces from this diagram, watching the signs. Compute your cross-sectional areas from there. All of the members are made of steel. So we would use that same modulus of elasticity throughout. So I will just give you these intermediate values and have you work these out on your own and then check your own work. So the deformation in FG is equal to twenty four point eight seven e minus three millimeters. These, of course, are to four sig figs because when I sum them together, I want to report my final answer to three sig figs. This one is also positive, so this is another elongation. And then we also need to figure out the deformation in piece G H. And that is a negative 83.80 E minus 3 millimeters. It's negative because the internal force is negative. All right, so to finish this problem, all we have to do is sum up the change in length between E and H. one back there. The change in length between F and G and the change in length between G and H. Okay, so I've got two positive terms and one negative that I want to sum up into this equation in order to determine the contents of this these brackets here. Before we do that, let's make sure that these answers we got make sense. Because normally, if I were to see deformations in a problem like this, and if I were to see this value, which is about 10 times more than the order of magnitude of these two, 
that's a red flag for me to immediately check my work and make sure that I didn't make a silly error. Does this make sense? Does it make sense that the deformation in EH is roughly 10 times that of FG? Okay, let's check. It's got more force in it, quite a bit more, right? It has over twice as much force as the other segments. So yeah, it's going to get more elongation because of that. The lengths are all the same. So they're all five meters long. That was held constant in this particular problem. So that's not going to change anything. Um, but look at the areas. You see this area is relatively small. This one is quite a bit bigger because you're squaring that radius in the pi r squared term or the pi over four diameter squared term. And so, yeah, it makes sense that if I were to do an apples to apples comparison of these two, I'm looking at the areas, I'm looking at the amount of internal force and saying, yeah, that answer makes sense. So give these a reality check as you go. Okay, let's sum them up. The result of u sub e equals, and I'm still going to put positive or minus kind of as a question mark, but the deformation between E and H, and I just realized, I'm sorry, that one of my subscripts is incorrect. This first one is E and F, sorry about that. Next one is F and G, last one is G and H. Okay, so I just want to sum these three um, values together. That summation is 224 E minus 3 millimeters. And it is positive, right? The positive terms one. I had a very large positive term, had more positive here, and then just a small amount of negative. So I did get a net positive term. That means net elongation between plane E and plane H. If the member is overall elongating and if it is anchored at the right, the only place for it to grow is to the left. Left. <laughs> so we're anchored at the right. That elongation will send plane E to the left. So a couple ways to express this final answer. First of all, by the way, I did condense this down to three sig figs, you know, now that I'm at the end of the problem. So we are going to express our answer in one of two ways. The, the translation of plane E is, and this is very awkward, I would probably be inclined to report this as 0.224 millimeters. If you wanted to use the, the E minus three or to change the metric prefix, that would be okay too. But we're very accustomed to seeing deformations in terms of millimeters. And we're also, you know, if the number completely follows the decimal, in fact, so like it's not like 0 0.0002, um, that is the way I would probably express that. Okay, so I would either express that as with a minus sign, that means in the negative x direction, or to the left, or another way to write this, and I think this one is less ambigu ambiguous and less confusing, is I just put an arrow right next to it, right next to it as shown. So this last one would be my preferred way to express the answer to this problem. We were asked to find the translation of plane E, and we determined that plane E translated 0 0.224 millimeters to the left. That's the end of this problem. I hope this was helpful for you.